Howdy, it's Tubal Kane again, and for the second time this month, I'm at Lost Creek Machinery, this time to make a video expressly about the South Bend Vertical Mill. So let's go on inside and take a look at it. Howdy again, it's Mr. Pete, and I'm in the Lost Creek Machinery warehouse here, or showroom, and I'm standing next to a South Bend Vertical Mill. Now these are pretty rare birds, but this video is all about these vertical mills from South Bend, which my brother and I had a love affair for, and at that time we were not able as teachers to buy Bridgeport mills in the early 70s or late 60s, they weren't available, but this one was available from South Bend. So. My brother bought two of them for his shop at La Salle, and I bought one in Streeter at a, in approximately 1970, I'm not sure exactly when. And uh, then we found them to be great machines, but this specific machine here, this actual Bridgeport that I'm, or <laughs> South Bend, that I'm touching, came from K&K &K Engineering where my brother worked in Bloomington when we were in graduate school and this is how we became acquainted with these South Bend vertical melts. This, so, this thing has been around for over 50 years now and uh, they declared it surplus down there so it's available for sale here in this shop. But I thought it's so interesting that this is the actual original one. And I'm going to do a walk around here and give you some details on it. And uh, I hope you enjoy the video. It might be a little more detailed than what you want, but it is what it is. So let's take a look at it. Twenty years ago, before I bought the Bridgeport Mill that is in my basement, I was looking to buy one of these South Bends, and here is the reason. Notice down here that the column is a separate casting from the base, so in fact it could be disassembled, the bolts are from the bottom, and much more easily moved than a bridge port. Also the early South Bends were all one piece, and I'll show you pictures of that in some of the literature which I have uh, available and we'll look at later, but I thought this was one of the very unique features of a South Bend. Let me know if you have one of these or have ever used one. Leave, leave those notes in the comments. Another interesting thing about this machine is that they used one of the South Bend quick change gear back boxes and I'm sure it's been adapted with the motor under here and that has a drive shaft, has some U-joints here and that provides the longitudinal feed for the machine. It's all strictly mechanical and you have quite a few different speeds here. Now the one that I had at the high school was made about five years later than this and they no longer used this at that time but instead used a power feed very similar to what you'll see on modern bridge ports with a, a little motor right here and a handle. The one I had was made by Servo. It was an option, but it was relatively delicate for high school students to use. There were no belt guards from the factory, so this belt guard, which is pretty nice design, is homemade probably at K&K &K Engineering, and I had to make them also in the high school where I worked because the insurance man came in and of course he didn't like those open belts and actually neither did I. This is uh, before OSHA. South Bend used a round ram rather than a dovetail ram and in the literature which I'll show you later they actually have uh, several points where they tell you that this is superior but of course that might be advertising baloney but who knows but it is keyed and there are two screws right here that can be loosened and the crank, the knee crank, which is missing one of the pins, could be used right here to crank the ram in and out. This machine was equipped with a power quill feed, that's this unit here, and it is hydraulic so that you could bore with a power feed. 
But the funny thing is this entire box that you see here contains the pump and the controls and the motor and everything and that's almost as big as a machine used just for the power quill feed. So they've come a long way since this machine was built. South Bend Mills used a number 30 milling machine taper. Now that's just an end mill holder. I think that's, I'm not sure what that is. I don't think it's all there. ZZ, I think, were the collet size. They were a double angle collet made by Universal. And there was a spanner wrench for this. I don't see it laying here. I always particularly liked the brake, which has a very long lever and a lot of leverage because of it. That was the spindle brake. This milling machine was made in approximately 1965. My brother worked there when this machine was delivered. And he was so excited about it that I came from the other shop where I was working in Bloomington and uh, came over and examined it. I thought, boy, that's ever a nice machine. But I, what I was starting to say is that they didn't have digital readout then, at least not that was moderately priced. And they used dial indicators. So there is a dial indicator for the for the Y axis, well, it's actually it's missing. There would have been, been an indicator in here and a plunger and rods that were used so you could very accurately locate your work, much as you do on a jig bore. Here is the other one for the, uh, the X axis. I'm not sure where this was located. I, I really don't know if it, if, if it was just laying here, but they had a little cover to protect the lens on the dial indicator. This machine has seen a lot of use. I guess what I didn't show you a little earlier here is on this gearbox here. This is the drive shaft and there's a U-joint here and I believe one down here. And this is not spline, but it is a hexagon that will slide in and out of the mating piece. And this switch here would have been for the motor on the gearbox. And then another switch on the other side for that hydraulic motor and then a switch up on the head around the front there for the actual spindle motor. Up in the head here, right below the motor, are the pulleys and there are four steps here for the V-pulley, V-belt, and then two different sets of uh, timing gear type belts, a high and a low. A little bit awkward to change the speeds, but so are the standard Bridgeport J-heads for that matter. There would, of course, have been a belt guard on here. It's long gone. I think that one of these studs here and maybe another one is missing that held the belt guard on. I don't remember much about that. This is a machine that I never did operate. However, my brother did. These machines sold for about seventeen or eighteen hundred dollars at the time, but the power feed would have been extra as would those dial indicators and the rod system for measuring. So they had a lot of options, and uh, this machine is available. I think he's got it priced at about $1,900. So that's still a pretty nice machine for somebody someday. And they can get it down their basement by taking it apart. Now looking at the head here, it's pretty self-explanatory, but of course we have a quill feed here, much like a bridge port. And then a hand wheel also for boring that you can use either manually or hydraulically with this control. An adjustable threaded type stop, very similar to a bridge port. And up here is the spindle lock. Which allows you to ch change collets.
Well, that pretty much covers the walk around and some of the details of this machine. So I will conclude this part of the video and I will finish it up when I get back home into my home shop and I want to show you some of the pictures and literature that was sent out by South Bend, even uh, a brochure when this machine was introduced in the mid-60s. And come to Lost Creek Machinery here for all of your machining needs. This is not a sponsored video. These guys are just friends of mine and allowed me to come in here and film this. So thank you, Matt and Jason. Okay, it's an hour later and I'm back in the sanctuary of my basement shop and I want to continue talking about this South Bend Mill and I want to show you some pictures out of this catalog from 1956 which is apparently the year that that machine was introduced for their 50th anniversary and then I have some other paperwork to go through and some pictures and specifications and various things like that to show you and there'll be lots of still pictures at the end so we're only about halfway done here again this is the 1956 catalog and they call it the new South Bend vertical spindle precision milling machine and I'll get some close-ups of these specifications and put them at the end and of course there's my girlfriend as usual and you know she's been complaining that the chips snag in her nylon but who's looking? But what I wanted to talk about here is the different shape of the base. And notice that the column and the base are all one and that it tapers off and looks kind of narrow at the back. Also it says South Bend on the side of the column where you may not have noticed but over at Lost Creek it is vertically on the spine or back of the machine mostly covered by electrical components and here it is on the facing page that's a nice picture of it again with the one piece casting now when I bought mine for the school I purchased this six inch swivel vise and it was made by Palmgren I didn't like it. It was incredibly heavy, including the swivel base, and the chips could get right in around the screw. That number 30 milling machine taper collet looks like this, double angle, and it was made again by Universal. Let me correct myself now, and this is a mailer that was sent to machine shops dated 1955, and they stepped it up a notch with this model, didn't they? But it is an announcement of a new member of the South Bend family, and they're not talking about the girl. Also, the one-piece casting. High heels in a shop. All of the pictures from here on out came from Keith Rucker's wonderful site, VintageMachinery.org. And this is also about 1955 or 1956. Again, they're calling it the New South Bend, the greatest. And it is $1,675. Notice that there is no power feed or quill feed on this one. Those were all options. And this was the two-page spread from the catalog. Now here is a catalog picture advertisement a year or so later and they've upped the price already to $17.42 and this machine weighs 1,600 pounds as pictured. It looks just like the one that I purchased except that mine also had the power feed here on the end of the table. I very much get a kick out of this. They're talking about how much better their round column is than a Bridgeport Dovetail or this other manufacturer. I'm not sure who made that, but this is wrong, this is wrong, and theirs is right. 
And of course the head could be tilted right or left. And here's a picture of the dial indicator. Remember the one I showed you over at the shop was missing or broken, but that's what it looked like originally for the x-axis. Now this is what I really wanted to show you. This is a picture of the parts list from the 1966 publication that would have come with the machine and you can now finally see or I finally understand that it was made with two different bases. Apparently this was the earlier style all one piece and then later they went to the two piece style and that's what I had at the high school and that's what they had over at Lost Creek and you can see that that can be taken apart and moved down a steps fairly easily compared to this. Also notice that on the one piece base it is quite narrow and I think the machine could have a tendency to tip and would definitely need to be bolted to the floor. When I bought this Bridgeport Mill in 1999 from Joliet Township High School I had actually been looking for a South Bend for all of the reasons that I previously told you, but I never did see one for sale except for this one that we looked at today and that's how I ended up with my Bridgeport and I'm not sorry, it just was a big chore getting this 800 pound column down the stairs that's right behind it so you can imagine that. So I hope you enjoyed this exhaustive study of the South Bend Vertical Mill. I know it was a lot more than you wanted to know, and I don't think anyone else has covered this subject on YouTube. So thanks for sticking with me, and there's a lot of still pictures to follow. Also, when I got home and pulled the car into the driveway an hour ago, my granddaughter called me over next door, and there was a big old 12-inch snapping turtle laying eggs. So I got just a little bit of footage of that. You know, it takes them a long time to lay the eggs, so it isn't very dramatic. I, I didn't get to see any eggs drop in the hole, but I'm going to go back out there later. But I'll show you a little bit of that for those of you that like a rep. So, uh, thanks for watching. I'll put the link in the description again for Lost Creek Machinery. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Don't turn this off. There's still five minutes worth of stills.